tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. Before we get started with everything, I wanted to make sure that you aren't missing out on all the dastardly delights that we have to offer. Scary Stories Told in the Dark is but one of many shows you could be listening to. And on January 26th, don't miss the upcoming episode of the Eric Peabody-hosted Horror Hill, entitled A Reflection on 17th Street. Be sure to uh, also not miss Drew Blood, Dark Tales, Fear from the Heartland, hosted by Paul J. McSorley, or the eponymous Chilling Tales for Dark Nights podcast. You can find all of these on YouTube and the podcast platform of your choice, or you can get ad-free versions by subscribing at the Chilling Tales for Dark Nights website. Thank you again, dear listeners, for staying as spooky as you do. <laughs> Good evening. I'm storyteller Otis Gyre, and I ain't your grandfather. From where I'm from, we don't do bedtime stories. And if that's what you were expecting, you're in the wrong place. If it's terrifying tales you're after, well then, I've got just the thing. Get comfortable, settle in. Turn off the lights, if you dare. Your night is about to get a whole lot darker. <laughs> Who needs sleep anyway? <laughs> Good evening, you're listening to Scary Stories Told in the Dark. Welcome, dear listeners, to Season 12, Episode 9. I'm your host, Otis Jiry, and in this episode I'll be performing four tales to terrify you, courtesy of author Micah Edwards. Tonight you'll hear tales of twisted trails, maritime misbehavior, rotting roads, and mysterious monotony. You're listening to the standard edition of tonight's program, which contains the first two spine-tingling stories. If you'd like to show your support and enjoy an extended version of this and other episodes with twice the terror, visit simplyscarypodcast.com and click Patrons in the upper menu to sign up today. Thank you for your support. Now, it's time to take a walk together down the moonlit trail. So lock your doors, turn your lights down low, and settle in. The show is about to begin. <laughs> this episode of Scary Stories Told in the Dark is sponsored by June's Journey. Discover your inner detective. While I enjoy my shakes and shivers as much as the next person, what I also enjoy is a good mystery. Now, sometimes it's with a good book, sometimes with an audiobook or radio play, thrilling me one minute and leaving me satisfied the next. But there's something about digging into a mystery with a little more interactivity, shall we say. And just like I like to do, I heartily recommend digging into June's Journey. June's Journey may seem like a hidden object game, but the story isn't just going back to the 1920s to solve a simple murder mystery. Oh no, our heroine, June, is set to discover that her family has more than one skeleton hiding in its closet. And even when you think you've solved everything, more chapters are introduced each week. And I tell you, there's nothing more exciting to seeing that there are new clues and new mysteries to solve. Yes, discover the secrets of Orchid Island. 
Wonder if who you meet in Chapter 2 is working with you or against you. And then by the time you start traveling the globe by Chapter 5, well, perhaps I've said too much. I'll let you dig into that on your own. Pick up where you left off to uncover new secrets or start your investigation today and download June's Journey, available on Android and iOS mobile devices, as well as on PC through Facebook games. Going off the beaten path is not really meant to be taken literally. If you're in the woods, you believe wandering into its deepest recesses is a good idea. Just remember that you're putting out all the dedicated rangers who will have to go in after you. Case in point, let's join two of those rangers right now as they go on a hunt for a relative of a VIP with the help of some very interesting people. Without further ado, I present to you The Scent of Bones. Saddle up. Bigwig's missing. That was my partner, Gabriel. He was the senior ranger in our small park, having been hired nearly two weeks before me back in 2006. I felt that now that we'd both been there for more than a decade, it was perhaps time to consider each other equals. Gabriel disagreed. We mainly got along anyway, so I never bothered to press the point. He was welcome to believe that he was in charge as long as he never expected me to follow his orders. What's the deal? I checked the time as I started to gather up the necessary gear. It was still before noon, which was a relief. It meant that we'd be doing at least the initial search during the day. Daytime searches had a much higher rate of success. Also, a much lower rate of tripping over tree roots in the dark. The governor's cousin went out for a hike yesterday never made it back. It's still early. No chance it was an overnight and he's still on the trails. Uh, she, and no, didn't bring any camping gear, apparently. Car is still at the trailhead. Cell phone goes straight to voicemail. Well, trailhead gives us a starting point, at least. We'd had worse beginnings. Oftentimes, when someone went missing, the person calling it in didn't know any more than that they'd been heading out to the park. Although our park was considered small, that was only a relative term compared to the other national parks, it still covered over 10,000 acres. Given that amount of ground to search, it was nice to at least know what path our missing person started on. Forward the office phone to your cell and let's get going. Gabriel instructed me as if I didn't know how things worked. I forwarded the calls to his cell instead. Minutes later, our jeep was bumping along the dirt path that led back to the main road. Gabriel's cell phone rang. He gave me a dirty look as he answered it. Ranger Station? Uh, yes, sir. We're already on it. Twenty minutes, maybe. Well, but... He pulled the phone away from his ear and showed it his middle finger. I couldn't make out what was being said, but the speaker sounded insistent. Gabriel put the phone back to the side of his head. Fine, then we'll wait. But as Senior Ranger, I want to point out. He was cut off by another staccato burst of words. I saw him mouth something at the phone. Couldn't make it out exactly. But I was certain it was rude. Understood, sir. Gabriel hung up the phone and glared at me kept my eyes on the road. I told you to forward the calls to your phone, he said. I must have hit the wrong button. Yeah, he snorted. I said nothing. We rode on in silence for a moment before he continued. Well, anyway, they've got some tracker coming in. We're supposed to wait for him at the trailhead. For how long? If we don't get started soon. Yeah, what do you think I tried to tell them? The governor was clear. We wait. That was the governor? I was legitimately impressed. I didn't think the governor knew the name of our park, let alone the number to reach us. 
Yeah, you'd think he'd have people to call for him, right? I guess he must really like his cousin, Gabriel laughed. Kind of wish she'd gone missing years ago. Maybe we could have gotten some funding out of it. Hey, if he calls back, you can bring that up. Better make sure we can find her at this point, though. Yeah, we've got like an 80% recovery rate. Those are good odds. I'd extort a public official with that chance of success. I get that this banter sounds a bit dark, but it sort of comes with the territory. The fact of the matter is, most people who go missing in parks show back up on their own. They find their way back to the trails, get their bearings, and make their way back to civilization, or at least to other hikers. The ones who are truly lost, off the trail lost, we might find 10% of them. Even fewer if you're on the count of the ones we find alive. 10,000 acres is a lot of space, is my point. So it helps to make jokes about the search. Humor distracts you from dwelling on the numbers. It keeps your mind off the fact that the person's life's on the line. In this case, we were also trying not to think about the fact that we were being asked to delay the start. Minutes can matter in rescues. We were already maybe a day behind, and now we're going to have to cool our heels in a parking lot instead of getting on the trail. Four hours, probably, unless some reason they'd call the tracker before calling us. Even if he was local, it was a long drive from pretty much anywhere to the park. So you can imagine my surprise when, not more than 15 minutes after Gabriel and I got to the trailhead, we started hearing the heavy thwop, thwop, thwop of a helicopter. We both stared up at the sky and watched it rapidly approach. They can't possibly be planning on landing here, Gabriel said, looking doubtfully around the tiny gravel lot. I think they are, I said, scrambling off of the back bumper. Quick, back in the jeep. We dove inside and slammed the doors as the helicopter settled down less than 20 feet away, kicking up a massive cloud of dust and tiny rocks. We listened to them ping off the jeep's metal frame as the rotors slowed to a stop. Nice, said Gabe. The governor's going to pay for a new paint job? Quit whining and look professional, I told him. We got people to meet. Two men climbed out of the helicopter, wearing more or less matching jumpsuits. They were the same color and had the same company logo, stitched on the chest, but they wore them differently. The first man's clothing fit him well, looking like the comfortable and athletic outfit that it was. He wore a backpack covered in pouches and snugged it correctly around his shoulders and waist. He was clearly no stranger to hiking. The second man was practically lost inside his jumpsuit. The collar sat high in his neck while the sleeves hung past his thumbs and the legs were bunched up at the ankles. The wind from the slowing helicopter blades pressed the loose fabric against his body, revealing him to be disturbingly thin. Emaciated might have been the right word, even. His face was gaunt as well, and the dry skin stretched over his bald head and looked as if it might crack at any moment, freeing the bones with him. And to the rangers, the athletic man asked Gabriel and I as we clambered out of the car, I'm Mr. Davis, and I'm Byron, said the thin man walking up behind him. I saw Davis press an eye roll, which I found odd. Byron hadn't done anything other than introduce himself. Still, I'd certainly rolled my eyes at Gabriel enough times over our careers, so I assumed I was just missing some key backstory here. How well do you know this park, asked Davis. Better than anyone, said Gabriel. I didn't roll my eyes, but only because I was used to his bragging. I was better on the searches than he was, and he knew it, and that was all that mattered. And you, Davis continued, turning to me, the governor's sister is depending on us. He had a straight answer, no vanity. I thought it was the governor's cousin, I asked. Sorry, I misspoke. How well do you know the woods? Davis's gaze drilled into me, frighteningly intense. Well enough and find her if anyone can. Oh, don't worry about that. Byron here is the tracker. We just need you to keep us on the trails. I cast a doubtful glance at Byron. 
His pallid skin certainly hadn't seen the sun recently, and his eyes looked watery and weak. Besides, what sort of track couldn't follow blazed trails? Gabriel spoke, and the skeptical tone in his voice revealed that he shared my misgivings. Well, we'll take point, and your man can show us anything we missed. You know how long until the other volunteers get here? No other volunteers. This will just be us. Impossible, Gabriel said. Do you understand what size we're talking about here? Over 15 square miles. More to the point for our method of progress. Almost 50 million feet. You know how little space a fallen human takes up? Even with outed people, this would be a crapshoot. You want to do it with four? Davis wasn't listening. He turned to Byron and was unrolling a long leather cloth, the sort of thing an old-timey craftsman might have kept in his tools. This one just contained dozens of what looked like white toothpicks, each carefully pinned to the leather beneath an emblazoned number. He selected one of the toothpicks and held it out to Brian. Smell it. I know her, Byron said, turning his face away. Smell it. The threat of violence was clear in Davis's clipped words. Reluctantly, Byron leaned forward and smelled the proffered sliver. Closed his eyes as he inhaled deeply. Weirdly, I saw a bit of drool gather at the edge of his mouth before he lifted away. With his eyes still closed, Byron pointed. There. Gabriel and I both turned to look. He was just pointing at a random tree. Davis seemed satisfied, though. Come on, let's go. Rolled up his toothpick collection as he headed for the woods, Byron close behind. Neither Gabriel nor I followed. After a few steps, Davis stopped and looked back. Daylight's burning, shake a leg. You want us to follow you into those woods based on some sort of psychic nonsense, Gabriel said? Absolutely not. I don't care if you believe me, Davis said. I only care that you come with me. If you stay here, you won't have a job by the time I hit those trees, and you'll drastically reduce the chances of us finding our missing personal life. The matter-of-fact manner in which Davis delivered the ultimatum made it clear that it wasn't a threat. It was simply stating what would happen. And the resources that had been mobilized to bring him here I had no reason to doubt it. Gabriel and I exchanged an unhappy look and started forward. We hadn't gotten more than a hundred feet down the path when we heard the helicopter starting up behind us. Is he going to do the search from the air? Not much to be seen through these trees, I'm afraid, Gabriel said. Davis just grunted, his focus on Byron. Byron, for his part, still had his eyes mostly closed. He was moving forward at a steady pace, clearly untroubled by the roots or even trees in his way. Davis steered him gently around the obstacles, guiding him on a path even as Byron kept his head aimed in a direct line to his goal. Looks like you do have your shtick done pretty well, Gabriel said. What do you need us for? To tell us if the paths are wrong, Davis said. You seem to have a clear idea of where you're going. Not wrong, as in leading the wrong way. Wrong, as in incorrect. What's that even supposed to mean? Asked Gabriel, aggrieved. Stop asking questions and open your eyes. You'll understand when you need to. We walked along in silence for a while after that. I tried to keep an eye out around me, but my gaze kept drifting back to Byron. He still had his eyes shut, and he was drooling again. He wiped it away as I looked. I'm sorry about that, Byron said. It was the first thing he'd said since we left the parking lot. Sorry about what? I was five yards behind him, and as I mentioned, his eyes were closed. There was no way he was talking about what I'd seen. The drool. I can't help it. I don't notice it a lot of the time. But I notice when others are looking. How could you possibly know I was looking? I know, said Byron. Gabriel snorted. Eyes in the back of your head, huh? Well, something like that. How many fingers am I holding up? Four, said Byron. I looked back at Gabriel, and some holding up four fingers. 
he appeared as surprised as I was. One. Five, said Byron, responding as Gabriel raised the lowered fingers. He never paused in his forward movement. Davis regarded the entire situation with detached amusement. Gabriel grunted and moved his hand behind my back, completely hidden from Byron. None. Four again. One, said Byron. I could no longer see the number of fingers. But from Gabriel's reaction, Byron was still guessing correctly. How are you doing this? I asked. I'm good at knowing th where things are, Byron said with a slight but noticeable pause before the word things. And off game, said Davis, eyes in the surroundings. You're so sure Byron knows where she is. Why do you need to keep an eye out? asked Gabriel. Davis ignored him. We'd gone a couple of miles when I noticed Byron starting to flag. As I'd expected, he wasn't built for sustained walking. Hey, Byron, when was the last time you had some water, I asked, unlimbering my backpack. Something to eat. No, shouted Davis. Byron whipped around, his eyes squeezing shut so tightly they were nearly crushed in their sockets. His skull seemed to pulse under his thin skin. His teeth were bared, and saliva ran freely from his mouth, cascading down his chin in a terrifying gush. He took a single step toward me, and something white flared on the side of his neck, bright enough to shine through the tall collar that had previously hidden it. There was no shape or symbol I recognized, but whatever it was had an immediate effect on Byron. His eyes flew open, his jaw snapped shut. He stumbled and would have fallen if Davis hadn't caught him. Easy, said Davis, easy. You still got her? Yes. Byron swallowed thickly. Yes. He resumed, moving forward, his eyes mostly closed again. Over his shoulder, he said, I'd like some water if you don't mind. He tossed the bottle to Davis. Staying a few feet away from Byron felt prudent. We walked on in silence for a while, listening to the sounds of the forest. Gabriel was staring at Byron, as if convinced that he could sort out his sightless vision trick through sheer force of will. For my part, I looked anywhere but at the tracker. His reaction to the offer of food had shaken me in a way that I couldn't recall ever happening before. I faced down bears and hadn't even felt afraid for my life on such a fundamental level. Maybe it was because I was paying extra attention to the path that I started to notice the small oddities. Small things at first, like the path going straight ahead for too long. Nothing anyone new to the park would notice, but like I said, I know these trails. They twist and curve wherever the landscape leads them, and the terrain here is anything but straight. Every time I was about to remark on it, though, we'd come up on another curve. I told myself that I was just imagining things, and I kept quiet about it. The honest truth is, I really didn't want to do or say anything that would bring Byron's attention back to me. He'd been nothing but quiet and complacent since the incident, walking calmly ahead while Davis kept him from running into obstacles. But my heart rate was still higher than our activity level implied, and I couldn't get his feral transformation out of my head. Then I saw something that I couldn't let pass without comment. Gabriel, look. That's Jeroboam. The tree I was pointing at was an impressive sight, with a trunk twice as thick as my outstretched arms and branches that seemed to climb up into the sky itself. It was the oldest tree in our park, likely predating the foundings of our country by a few hundred years. Gabriel barely glanced at it. So... So, where did we come in? There's no way we're at Jeroboam. There's some way, said Gabriel, nodding his head at the giant tree. Here it is. Here we are. QED. Davis, strangely, was much less dismissive. He halted Byron with a firm hand on his shoulder. Stop. You certain? Positive would have had to diverge a half-mile back 
Maybe more to go get to uh, Jeroboam. Don't be stupid, said Gabriel. Shut up, Davis told him. Gabriel closed his mouth out of surprise. Byron? We're close, under a mile. Stationary, crouched down, either hiding or asleep. Let's hope for the latter, said Davis. To me, he said, I want you to look down at the path for the next ten or twenty steps. Focus on where you know we are. Don't get anything other than your feet and the ground in front of you. Confused, I did as he said, counting my paces. I was at fourteen when I heard Gabriel swear. The tree's gone. I was looking right at it, and it's different trees now. I looked up. Cherubim was indeed gone. Good work, said Davis. I had no idea what I'd done, but I was glad that whatever it was had been successful. Now, stay on your guard. She's twisting things. Even with the... With Byron here, it's going to get tricky. Byron opened his eyes long enough to glare at Davis, presumably, or whatever he'd almost said in place of Byron. Davis met his glare with a challenging stare of his own, and after a moment, Byron closed his eyes again and continued forward. After that, the paths started to get weird. There wasn't any other word for it. They curved in ways that should have led us around in circles. We started to see the same tree repeatedly, though not always on the same side of the path. Once, I looked over my shoulder and saw Gabriel, Davis, and Byron following me. Although when I looked back, they were still there ahead of me. Each time it happened, I dropped my focus to the path in front of me, looking at nothing but the dirt and the leaves directly under my feet as I stepped forward. After a dozen steps, I'd look back up, and the trail would behave again for a little while, and then I'd be back at staring at the ground. I started to feel like Byron, walking without seeing, following the path that I knew was there. A hundred yards, said Byron. He swallowed, a sound so wet that I heard it clearly from twenty feet away. Still not moving. She's not dead, is she? asked Davis. I would know if they were dead, said Byron. They? asked Gabriel. Thought we only had one missing hiker here. Two hundred and six, said Byron dreamily. He laughed and licked his lips. Focus, snapped Davis. Sounds like we lucked out. She's asleep. He looked at me and Gabriel and sighed. I think we ought to split up and come at her from two directions. It'll pin her in place if she wakes up. You're sounding like she doesn't want to be found, said Gabriel. Davis ignored this comment and pointed at me. You, go with Byron. Don't let him walk into any trees. You, come with me. Let Gabriel go with Byron, I pleaded. No. I wasn't usually so easily cowed, but something about Davis's tone brooked no argument. I reluctantly moved up behind Byron and put a hand on his shoulder. There was no fat at all, barely any muscle. Through the fabric, it felt like I'd laid my hand on bare bone. Not far now, said Byron. He stepped off the trail, and I attempted to guide him back. No, no, it's okay now. They're just up ahead. The trees stretched and warped around us, reaching and changing overhead. Byron moved on in steady steps, and I guided him between his dancing trunks, gripping him as much for my own safety as his. I was terrified to be lost in this writhing forest. Suddenly, there was a young woman ahead of us, curled up amongst the spreading roots of a tree. She wore a drab gray jumpsuit marked with the number 60 in several places. Her face was hidden by a wild tangle of black hair, and she did indeed appear to be asleep. Wake up! Byron hissed. At the sound, the woman startled awake, fear in her eyes. Hurry! They for... Still, said Davis, or something like it. The word he said was not that, but it meant that, in a deep, primordial sense. A symbol blazed black out of the nearby tree, and suddenly Davis was lifting a knife away to 
carving it as if he'd always been there. I did not have the ability to consider how he had gotten there or when. I was focused on the fact that I could not move my body, not even to blink my eyes or draw breath. Byron and the woman appeared similarly afflicted, and even the trees had stopped moving, both their unnatural twisting and their normal rustling. You'd been doing so well, 31, said Davis. He walked toward us, moving normally. I struggled for breath, black spots starting to dance in my vision, only to spoil it all right at the end. Well, it was a good experiment in any case. You obviously need more safeguards to be allowed out in the future. And you, 60. Davis turned his attention to the woman on the forest floor. We've already fixed up your escape route. Your new cell has angles even you can't distort. You won't be getting out again. My vision began to narrow, darkness closing in. My lungs wanted to heave, but even that motion was denied to me. I'm sorry to leave things like this, Davis said to me. You'll be all right once the sigil fades. Accept what you were told happened today, and things will work out well enough. Don't dwell too much on what you think you remember. Memories are faulty things. That was the last thing I heard before I blacked out. When I woke up, only a few minutes had passed, but Davis, Byron, and the woman were nowhere to be seen. The tree that held his sigil was nothing but a pile of cold ashes. There was no sign of other fire damage anywhere around it. Gabriel was missing as well. I shouted for him to no avail, and eventually gave up and made my way back to the trailhead, hoping to find him at the jeep. He wasn't there, nor was he back at the ranger station. His cell phone went straight to voicemail. The governor called later that day to thank us for the safe return of his sister, and promised anything we wanted in return. I told him that Gabriel was missing. Do you need helicopters? Dogs? Say the word and I'll send them. Uh, we could use the tracker you sent earlier, I said. Tracker? He sounded confused. I'm sorry, I have no idea what you're talking about. I didn't take him up on the helicopters or the dogs. I did look for Gabriel for days afterward, but I was unsurprised not to find him. The ones who are truly lost, off the trail lost, we very rarely find them. And I had the feeling that Gabriel, wherever he was, was farther off the trail than anyone had ever been before. I hope you enjoyed The Scent of Bones by Micah Edwards, as performed by yours truly. If you enjoyed that tale and would love to read more from tonight's very talented feature author, you can help support them by visiting simplyscarypodcast.com slash authors slash Micah dash Edwards. That's simplyscarypodcast.com slash authors slash M-I-C-A-H dash E-D-W-A-R-D-S. This episode of Scary Stories Told in the Dark is sponsored by June's Journey. Discover your inner detective. Families are mysterious things. Of course, the less you know about my family and where most of them bury the bodies, the better. But some families have mysteries that are just so intriguing. Take the story of June and her family. June's an amateur sleuth and her sister and her husband recently turned up dead. But see that this turns out to be murder. Well, that's just the beginning. And even better, it's up to you to see what secrets are hiding in June's journey. Yes, I will admit, listeners, that digging deeper into the mysteries of Orchid Island and even globetrotting uh, does give me a nice bit of brain teasing to get me going in the morning. What's even better? The adventure keeps going. Even if I think I've seen it all, by the next week, there's a new chapter, new clues, and one of many beautiful scenes to hunt through. 
And when I get tired of being on all by myself, I can join a detective club and put my wits up against other detective clubs in league play to see who truly is the greatest detective in the world. Pick up where you left off to uncover new secrets or start your investigation today and download June's Journey. Available on Android and iOS mobile devices, as well as on PC through Facebook games. Besides his haunting of Reddit and WordPress, you can find him in the printed world as well. Thanks again for your support of his program and of tonight's featured author. Between those two, it makes me wonder about the other 58 numbered souls and if there are more beyond 60. Just be concerned if you run into 24,601. You may think he's only in for stealing bread. You don't want to know the whole situation. Do you consider yourself a fan of the sea? The salty breeze, the crashing waves, the endless empty expanse where one can lose themselves for a bit, or a few others with a well-placed push. There's many a tale about the sea, but none so dangerous as those that are too easily believed. And, well, you want to cause a prank or two to those who haven't earned their sea legs, don't be surprised by the consequences. Without further ado, I present to you the Lonely Lieutenant. I used to love the ocean. Grew up around it, played in it, practically lived in it. When I turned 18 and went looking for a job, a fishing boat was an obvious choice. I wasn't afraid of hard work, and I sure wasn't afraid of the sea. I signed up quick as they'd take me and counted myself lucky to have landed the job. The ship that hired me was on a saner called the Whitecap. There were two other new crew members, a big lunk of a lad named Boris Olvach, and a smaller, pointier fellow named Keith Holmwood. I was somewhere in between the two of them in all respects, from size to intellect to general usefulness around the ship. Boris was as strong as he looked and could carry as much as Keith and I put together. When we were loading the ship, Keith and I would be struggling under the weight of a box between us, and suddenly see Boris striding by an identical box, hefted up onto one shoulder. His stride shook the deck, and you could hear his laugh all the way across the dock. He followed orders to the letter without ever complaining, but in the absence of guidance, he'd just sit around and wait to be told what to do next. Keith was smaller than me, a young man built of elbows and angles. He was as sharp as a tack, though, doing calculations in his head faster than I could have even written the starting numbers down on paper. Boris and I were going to be on deck duty forever. Clearly, Keith had a bigger future ahead. He wasn't stuck up about it, though. Right now, he was on manual labor just like we were, and none of uh, the three of us were any better than the others. The rest of the crew, now they were better than us. Most of them had been working together for years, some of them for decades. We were just a few more fresh fish to them. New faces to order around and give the scut work to. And play pranks on, of course. When there was work to be done, the crew was all business. But in the idle times in between, one of their main sources of entertainment was trying to get us to fall for whatever ridiculous story they'd come up with. They got me a few times, most notably with the sea bat. I came on deck one day to find all four of them gathered around a small metal crate. One of them, Court, was pinning it down with his foot and it looked like something was rattling around inside trying to escape. What do you got? I asked, walking over. It's a sea bat. A what? Sea bat. Decent sized one, too. Flopped up on deck and Derek caught it. Uh, can I see? I asked stupidly. Mm, sure, but you gotta be careful so it doesn't wriggle out. 
Get down on the deck and peek under the box. Real careful now. I got down on all fours and gripped the edge of the box, preparing to lift it up to take a peek. Suddenly, a board cracked across my hindquarters, hard. I yelped, lurching forward. The empty box went flying as the crew roared with laughter. How'd you like that, sea bat? Derek crowed. I rubbed my backside and laughed along with him. Never act like you can't take a joke. Not with that sort of group. Otherwise, you'd just become their target forever. Anyway, it was funny, at least when it wasn't happening to me. And most of the time, it was happening to Boris. Not because they picked on him more, but just because he fell for their pranks every single time. The language ones, especially. He was American-born and bred, but the subtleties of puns escaped him entirely. Ask him to go to the store for a long wait? He'd be there until the store closed, and come back apologetic and offering to go again tomorrow. Need someone to bring back a hundred feet of shoreline? Boris would go ask half the crews in the dock where to find it before someone took pity on him. He always laughed as hard as anyone when he found out he'd been duped, though. He seemed to genuinely enjoy the moment of realization. So, yeah, Boris was an easy target. But no one ever felt bad about it because he appreciated the joke, too. Keith, on the other hand, never fell for any of their tricks. Not a single one. He didn't ruin anyone's fun or anything. For example, on the sea bat day, I realized later that I'd passed him on the way onto the deck, and he'd clearly seen the whole setup and avoided it, but didn't drop so much as a word of it to me as a warning. He let it play out the way it was intended, and so no one was mad at him for dodging the jokes. But the idea of catching him out, of finally seeing him fall for a prank was on everyone's mind. The crew tried time and time again to set him up, and every time Keith saw it coming and sidestepped with a smile and a half shake of his head. He enjoyed watching the jokes as much as the rest of us, though, so when we heard Derek saying to Boris in a worried tone, Wait, your last name is Olvac? He wandered over to listen along with everyone else. Uh, Yeah, why? asked Boris. I don't know. I guess I'd never really connected it before. I'm surprised you're willing to work a boat. He saw Boris's confused expression and continued. Well, you know, the lonely lieutenant. It was clear that he was spinning Boris up for some long-winded yarn, and equally obvious that Boris had no idea this was going to end in a punchline. I hadn't heard with this one before, though. So I settled in to listen. You don't know? Well, shoot, I'll keep this as short as I can, but you definitely ought to know before we ship out. Not the sort of discovery you want to make once you're miles from shore. So, back in the day, the Brits had a little technique called press ganging. See, their Navy always needed sailors, but it was a risky life, and not everyone wanted to do it. So, when the recruitment offices were empty men headed down to the pubs to recruit there instead. The way it worked, they'd get a bunch of folks falling down drunk, drag them onto the ships while they were slipping it off. By the time they woke up the next day, they were already at sea, and it was too late to complain. It's a bit hard to walk home, and you can't even see the shore, after all. This one particular night, a Navy man was down at the pub, buying drinks for another crop of unwitting volunteers, And there's one fellow there, Theodore, just having the time of his life. He's all smiles, drinking the free beer, and telling him he's celebrating for he'd left the sea, and he was never going back. The Navy man just smiles, of course, and keeps the beers flowing. Come the end of the night, the press gangers come in to pick up the unfortunates and haul them away. Theodore is still upright, and he asks where everyone's going. The ship, says his drinking companion. Ah, well, may you have a good voyage. But not just them, he says. All of us. Come along now. He takes Theodore by the arm, but all of a sudden, it's like he's holding on to a demon. The man's fighting like he's got twice the number of limbs, just kicking and punching as he flees for the door. 
The Navy man's got a whole crop of men, though. They tackle him as he tries to get by. They sit on him, and after some punches and kicks of their own, he's out like the rest of the hall, and they drag him off to the docks. Morning comes, and the new sailors are woken up with a bucket of cold seawater thrown over them, and barked orders to get to work. Most of them wake up with some degree of complaints and cursing, but not Theodore. When that bucket of water hits him, he comes bolt upright and shrieks like he just had hot acid poured over him. Where am I? Where am I? Take me back, he says, grabbing the sailor who woke him. Too late for that, friend, says the seaman. You're in his Royal Majesty's Navy now, so you better... Theodore doesn't wait around to find out what he better do. He knocks that sailor out with one solid punch and goes running for the aft deck, where he shoves the helmsman away from the wheel and grabs control of the ship. The helmsman tries to grab it back, and Theodore throws him like a rag doll, hurling him into the rigging. Now the whole ship's scrambling at this point, sailors running from all over to drag Theodore away, but he's clinging to that wheel like a man possessed. Meanwhile, all of the other new recruits see an opportunity, and they start fighting the sailors, cheering Theodore on. The captain comes out waving his pistol, but he goes down in a wave of bodies, and all of a sudden... It's not a Navy ship anymore. It's a pirate vessel. The fighting goes on a bit longer, but everyone can see the writing on the wall, and most of the sailors don't want to die for a king that's never cared for them. Pretty soon, all of the original crew is locked up or changed sides. The men are all cheering Theodore, but he couldn't care less. He's turning the ship back the way it came, his eyes fixed on the horizon, like he can bring the coastline closer by staring. Maybe he can, too, for a wind springs up out of nowhere to fill their sails, and the ship starts to really move. All might have been well if they'd been the only ship leaving dock that day. But unfortunately for the mutinous crew, they're in view of the Monmouth. It wheels around when they do and gives chase, and soon enough the two ships are firing at each other. A good cannon shot splinters the mast on Theodore's ship, ruining his hopes of escape. The men of the Monmouth are ready for action, not taken by surprise, and by behind, as the other crew had been, and once they board Theodore's ship, it's pretty much over for the mutineers. The other men are all too happy to point a finger at Theodore as the ringleader. He gets dragged before the Monmouth's lieutenant, a young, fiery man by the name of John Olvok. Theodore pleads for his life, crying that he meant no harm, that he only wants to return to land. We land you're ever going to see again, says Olvek, is that endless plain at the bottom of the ocean. He has his crew chain a couple of cannonballs to Theodore's feet, then drags him to the edge and tosses him into the sea. He's already turning back to deal with the next mutineer before they even hear the splash. He hasn't gotten two words in before there's a second, much louder splash. All of a sudden, this titanic tentacle spears out of the sea towering over the Monmouth. Half a dozen men are killed as it slaps down on the deck, splintering wood and sending sailors flying. It's not alone either. There's another tentacle, and another, and another, all grabbing the ship and just ripping it apart. Men are screaming, men are diving into the sea, but where the water should be is this absolutely monstrous cracker. It ignores all of the struggling men in the water except for one, Lieutenant Olvac. Him, it catches in the end of a tentacle and lifts out of the water, hoisting high into the air. And then the kraken speaks in a voice so loud the very water shies away. I spent centuries learning the magics to compress myself into your form, it says. Traded away king's ransoms for the knowledge, for the preparations. I renounced my very home, the sea itself, for that was the trade I had to make. If I were to go to land, I could never immerse myself in the sea again. You took that from me, Lieutenant. Not twenty-four hours in, you stole that. It would have cost you nothing to show mercy. And so I shall show none to you and yours. 
mountains. I can no longer go to the land, so will your bloodline be forever denied the sea. Any who encroach upon it, I will tear apart. For now and all time, and you will watch, for I will keep you alive and by my side forever, my eternal companion in this salt prison. With that pronouncement, the Kraken dove, taking the hapless lieutenant with it. The rest of the men had left behind to sink or swim, as the sea saw fit. Enough of them made it back to tell the tale, certainly. Is it true? Boris asked, his face white. Probably not, Derek said. Sounds pretty fanciful, really. But then again, my last name's not Olvin, so it's an easy thing for me to dismiss. I'm sure you'll be fine, though. Okay, but come on, said Boris. You'll be on the same ship with me. You'll be taking the same chance. Derek looked into Boris's broad, honest face for a long, serious moment, and then he broke up laughing. <laughs> oh, Boris, you'll believe anything, won't you? Your family's been cursed by a giant eternal magic octopus. Shake it off, son. We got work to do. I joke, said Boris. He laughed, and though it sounded less hearty than usual. Yes, very good. Later, I heard him talking to Keith. You're certain there's no truth to it. Buddy, you've been on the water before, Keith told him. If there was an eternal instrument of vengeance that was going to hunt you down, it would have happened by now. Perhaps I'm just not there long enough. Keith sighed. Look, I'll look it up. This is a real story, or even a story that some sailors made up a few hundred years ago and wrote down. It'll be easy to find, I promise you. I'm not going to find any Lieutenant Olvak. The next day at work, Keith showed up looking tired. Good news, Boris. Lieutenant Olvak never existed. Really? asked Boris, brightening visibly. Really, Keith assured him. Want me to show you the sources? Boris, never a fan of reading, leaned away from the proffered phone like it was a live shark. No, no, I believe you. Thank you. Why are you looking so beat, I asked Keith. He looked around to make sure Boris was no longer listening. Okay, I found the weirdest thing. There's no Lieutenant Ova, like I told him. But the story's true. Or at least all of the survivors of the Monmouth went to their graves swearing. So if Lieutenant Olvag didn't exist, who'd the magic monster drag down to the depths with him? Keith glanced around once more, again checking for listeners. Lieutenant Holmwood. What? It was your great whatever who got the Kraken curse? No, there's obviously no Kraken curse, but... Well, look at this. Keith showed me his phone. He had tabs open of obituaries, newspaper articles, histories all of them discussing the aquatic deaths of people named Homewood. Wow, I said. Boy, that's sure enough to make you think. Inwardly, it was all I could do not to laugh. Derek had let me in on the secret last night. He found the story about Lieutenant Homewood in some book on sea monsters, and had immediately seized on the name. He figured that if he told it to Keith directly, Keith would just shrug it off. But if he acted like he didn't know it was about Keith, and let him do the research on his own, then he might just lead himself down a rabbit hole of belief. I thought it was a pretty convoluted plan when he explained it to me. Looking at Keith's face now, though, it looked like it had just tangled enough to catch him. So that's what, like, five or six homewoods who've drowned since the Kraken attack, I asked? I know, I know, said Keith. There's nothing statistically significant about it. It's just a weird coincidence. Hopefully, I told him. I'm not keen on the idea of sailing out with Kraken bait. I saw him looking out at the ocean more often than usual that day. His brow furrowed. I reported this back to Derek, who howled with laughter. Caught him at last, he said, clapping his hands. Don't tell him yet, though. We'll find a good way to spring it on him once we are out at sea. Days passed, and no one mentioned the story again. Keith seemed to have dismissed it, while Boris had forgotten it entirely. I caught a couple of members of the crew whispering and darting glances at Keith, though, so I knew that plans were still cooking. 
We'd been at sea for a few days when they sprung their trap. It was the end of the day, and the fat orange sun was burning low on the water, turning the sea into iridescent fire. I heard Derek call out, Drifter! Lost Mariner! We all scrambled to look. Sure enough, bobbing along the ocean swells, was a small rowboat with a single passenger. It was backlit by the setting sun, but we could see the man waving both arms wildly. He was clearly desperate for rescue, which only made sense. We were miles from shore. There was no place for a boat of his size. The captain swung the white cap around slowly, and we proceeded toward the lost sailor. The sun slipped lower as we approached, and details of the man and the boat began to come clear. It was at this point that I realized that this was somehow a scheme of Derek's and not a true refugee. The boat was encrusted with barnacles to an impossible degree. They grew three feet thick on the wooden hull, covering it both inside and out. It would have had to sit on the bottom of the ocean for a hundred years to look anything like that. There was no chance it would be seaworthy. The man inside the craft made no effort to row his boat closer to us. Once it became clear that we'd noticed him, he dropped his arms and simply waited. His clothes were tattered and salt-stained, which was only reasonable. But as we drew close, it became clear that they were the remnants of some sort of military uniform. This isn't right, said Keith. He'd noted the same features I had, but was reaching a far different conclusion. Captain, sail us away. Away? asked Eric, sounding genuinely confused. It's a rescue, Keith. It's the Kraken, Keith yelled. The story was about me. Please, we need to go. The story? Derek began to laugh. Oh, Keith, this is perfect. I can't. Keith? Keith had snatched up a thick metal bar from the deck and taken it off the bridge at a run. The other crew members grabbed him halfway there and bore him to the deck, screaming and thrashing. It's me! It's me it's after! It wasn't Boris! You thought you were pranking him, but it was me. And it's here. Settle down, settle down, Derek yelled, running to join the fracas. It was only a joke. I knew the story. I was winding you up. A shadow fell over the deck then, and I glanced back and froze in shock. The tattered mariner had risen from his boat, literally risen. He was now suspended twenty or thirty feet above our deck held aloft by an enormous tentacle that gripped the entire lower half of his body in a crushing embrace. We found another, Lieutenant, came a resounding voice, so loud that I felt the metal of the ship vibrating in time. Another of your spawn foolish enough to leave the land. We all gawped. There was a crashing boom as the tentacle fell onto the ship splintering railings and machinery beneath its mass. Metal shrieked and tore as another one wrapped around the bow and squeezed. Is this one enough, Lieutenant? The voice mused as we scrambled for the lifeboats. Another tentacle casually tore the power block from its moorings, ripping a massive hole in the ship as it did so. Black water gushed in. Will it be enough to pay for what you took from me? I frantically worked to free my lifeboat from the stricken ship. Derek piled in with me, and I saw Keith running toward us as well. I reached out a hand to help him in, and then something grabbed him from behind and whipped him up into the air. I heard him shriek from a terrifyingly great distance overhead, gaining in volume until it ended with a bone-cracking smack against the subsiding deck. Let it be enough, I heard a water-choked voice say barely audible over the rushing of the water. Please. It will be enough, came the boom. You have paid for the eternity you cost me on land. There was a final great crashing of water and a wave that nearly swamped our lifeboat. When it had passed, all was quiet except for the shouting of our small crew as we found each other in the dimming light. I thought the boat was your doing, I said after a while. I started Derek, my mind unable to process what had happened. I thought that was your joke. 
Dirk pointed at something drifting in by the flotsam. A long piece of blue rubber. I just bought a fake tentacle on board. I figured I'd get him with it at dinner one night. He paused, then adding quickly, I didn't know. How could I know? The ocean contains a great many secrets, not all of which it is good to know. These days I let it keep its secrets to itself and keep my feet firmly on the shore. I hope you enjoyed The Lonely Lieutenant by Micah Edwards, as performed by yours truly. If you enjoyed what you've heard tonight, I'd like to remind you one last time that tonight's featured author can be found by visiting our website. Just visit simplyscarypodcast.com slash authors slash Micah dash Edwards. That's simplyscarypodcast.com slash authors slash M-I-C-A-H dash E-D-W-A-R-D-S. He has books, Reddit, and a whole host of other things to keep you busy. Uh, but also, I would remind you to check out our Chilling Tales Anthology Volume 1, where he has a nice chilly tale you can enjoy, along with 29 others. Volumes 2 and 3 coming soon. Thanks again for your support of this program and of tonight's featured author. As a reminder, if you decide to give tonight's talented author stories a read, please consider leaving him a quality review and a kind word or a thoughtful public comment and an upload. And be sure to let him know you heard about him here on this program and that Otis Chiry sent you. It means more to me than you can imagine, and I'm sure Micah would appreciate it as well. Thanks again for your support of this show and of tonight's featured author. Now... Before we go, I'd also like to take a moment to thank you personally for joining me on this episode of Scary Stories Told in the Dark. If you enjoyed what you've heard on today's program, please take a moment to stop by our iTunes page or wherever else you listen to your favorite podcasts and leave us a five-star review and a kind word. It makes a huge difference and would mean a lot to us. If you'd like to hear a premium extended edition, of tonight's and all of our other episodes featuring twice the terror, visit simplyscarypodcast.com today and click the patrons link in the menu at the top of the screen. You'll find yourself at chillingtalesfordarknights.com where you can purchase season passes for this podcast and our other quality storytelling programs. Or become a patron for as little as $5 a month. You get access to our entire audio archive dating back to 2012, all of it ad-free. If you happen to use Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or YouTube, you can follow and subscribe to Chilling Tales for Dark Nights there, where you'll get all of our latest updates and new releases and have the chance to interact with us each and every week. You can subscribe to me on YouTube as well at the Otis Jiry channel, where you'll find releases of my series, Horror Storytime, dating back to 2014. And you can find me on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, too. Just search for Otis Jiry. Until next week, stay spooky. Get some sleep. If you can. <laughs>
and my extensive collection of narrated tales there. Simply search on YouTube by my name, and you'll find me. And don't forget to subscribe and press the bell notification icon to get my latest releases. Got a scary tale of your own that you'd like performed? I take submissions. Email it to me today at otis at simplyscarypodcast.com to have your terrifying tome considered for production in a future episode of this show. That's O-T-I-S at simplyscarypodcast.com. If you've enjoyed what you heard on tonight's program and are joining us on your favorite podcast app, subscribe to us to be sure you never miss an episode and leave a five-star review and a comment. Your feedback means a lot to me. You can also follow Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and yours truly on Facebook to connect anytime and get the latest updates on this and other programs and my channel. If you're listening on the Chilling Tales for Dark Nights YouTube channel, do us a favor and hit the subscribe button and the bell notification icon for CTFDN as well to get more spooky tales from me and the crew and another episode of this program each and every Wednesday. And don't forget to hit that thumbs up button to tell us how we're doing and leave a kind word or a request. And don't forget to visit us at ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com and consider supporting the team by becoming a patron. In addition to helping us out, you'll get exclusive access to our audio archive and ad-free downloads of all your favorite stories, including those you've heard on this program. As for me, I'll be back next Wednesday with more terrifying tales to keep you up all night. But that's all right. Who needs sleep anyway? <laughs>